Dr. C. C. Miller was a, um, a medical doctor. Uh, he came up with the Miller frame, okay, and he raised his queen cells, and the, and the bees would always put the, bee, uh, the cells on the edges. They never put them on the face of the comb. And, and Dr. Miller could never understand why. He always had an edge perimeter, and that's the way he would cut those cells off and then recruit his new starts and stuff. Um, I, I have to thank and, and Day Dance for letting me uh, use some of the, the work that they have in their books. Uh, and this is this is came out of uh, uh, AI Root, and uh, Dr. Dr. Miller wrote for both of those both of those uh, companies. Okay, and then G GM Doolittle, uh, he should have had a degree from somebody because he certainly d earned it. He, uh, he's the one who invented grafting and in, in, in 1888, and he was the first one that invented out apiaries. And in, in uh, to start apiaries away from home. In fact, he had an automobile back in the late 1800s already where he would go to his, his bee yards. Those guys, uh, all three of those gentlemen were creationists. They, he, they believed in, in the creation theory and, uh, and so do I. I and uh, I can relate to those guys. Now that nature explained to me what's going on and uh, and if you read their work, uh, it's very clear how they feel about it. Okay, how did the honeybees develop? We talk about geographical location. We talk about the Carnolians, which you were talking about, and the Caucasians, and the Italians. And they were all population bred and were separated from the Alps. So they, they, that's how they develop their certain straight, uh, their traits and behaviors, and et cetera, okay? And it's the same way with the Africanized bee in Africa. The honey hunters would, would steal honey from the, the gentle hives, but the, the mean ones they left alone. So the, the Africanized bees start getting meaner and meaner and meaner. So, uh, and this is a basically, uh, the way the way it was separated, and how your different races of bees bees develop. Okay, when I started beekeeping back in the 70s, each dot represents a queen breeder. There was over 300 queen breeders uh, in the United States when I started. Plus, there was bees in all the wild trees and in garages, and and there was a, a tremendous gene pool. Okay, a uh, lot, of, lot of bees. And uh, now, to 10, we got less than 100 queen breeders, and we don't have any uh, feral colonies no more. They might be there for a year or two and then roll, wipe them out. Okay, and so we've lost all our wild colonies. And this is why I'd like to have everybody raise their own queens so we can have gene pools all over. Okay, now, before we get going too far, a, a virgin queen on her mating flight will fly up to 10 miles. She'll seek out a drone congregation area, okay? And maybe a drone flew in from 10 miles to be in that drone congregation area. That's kind of the way they work with pheromones. So that virgin queen knows where that is. Uh, you hear how sensitive the bees are and the you know, uh, odors and stuff, and so, you might be mating, she might be mating with a drone from a hive 20 miles away. If that one came 10 miles and she went 10 miles, uh, there's no way, there's no way to control the breeding of the honeybee, okay? Contrary to what a lot of people want to think, the honeybee is the only thing I know of, livestock, that's got a reproduction uh, system the way it does, okay? It's, uh, it's incredible because When you breed Holstein cattle, you have a bull and a cow. When you breed racehorses, you have the stud and the mare. But honeybees, 
got 15 daddies in a heart. How can you possibly keep a stream pure? It's impossible. In fact, finally it was mentioned here in the January issue of Bee Culture, this last January under Intercover, Kim Flodham finally says, you know, scientists are now believing that you can't be, uh, breed a better bee. Because even if you graft out of a best queen, chances of getting the same daddy is one in 15 or less, or, you know. And so you can control the, the maternal, but you can't control the paternal. And so honeybees are population bred. And so I decided a long time ago, you breed from the survivors in your own yard. The best hive, in the, uh, best bee in the world is, is the one that's overwintered in your own yard. And that's who you want to rear re queens from. Now, people talk about, I got Russians, I got Minnesota Hygienics, or I got this and that, and I'm not going to interfere at all with their marketing plan. But even if they had the original right from Russia or whatever, the first queen you get is 50% because it's made it here, the F1 hybrid. So how in the world can you say I got pure Italians or I got pure Russians or anything? And with the migratory system of the American beekeeping industry, it's on wheels. They go to California, they come all over. Everything is mixed. And people will say, well, if they got a yellow bee, it's an Italian. And who's going to prove them wrong? You know, it's just the way they want to market it. But to me, all the bees in the United States are mutts. Okay, it's just the genetic gene pool, and I don't know of any other uh, organism that has a reproductive system like that. It resists, it absolutely resists selective breeding. You take instrumentally inseminated queens and you can keep a line going for a little while, but the bees don't like it. They'll, they'll supersede them. It's not natural. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay. All these females down here, and this is what the inside of a hive looks like. All those different drones from all different places. You see what I mean? You can't, you can't keep the race pure. I started with grafting, and now what I do is notching. And I do that with a hive tool. Okay, and I take 36-hour old larva or less, and that's what you would normally use to graft. And I found out the difference, what Miller was talking about on the edge, what makes the bee's behavior change toward that larva is that cell wall below the larva. When Miller, when you saw the V things, Miller would have them draw a comb like that, and then he would trim them. Well, he always thought it was edge perimeter, but when he trimmed them, he broke the bottom of the cell walls of some of those cells and he didn't know what was happening. Now, I, when I started, I, I produced on a horizontal frame, if you got larva, put, put the frame horizontal above queenless bees and they'll raise queen cells because there's no cell wall below the larva. It's open. So when I remove that bottom third of the cell wall below the larva, then I can produce queens anywhere I want because queens are females and so are workers. Okay, so when I break that cell wall, that changes the behavior. Now this is the size larva you need. Okay, I t take a, a cell in half and if I can get three little larva or six larva in the whole bottom, that's about the right age. Honeybee larva are mass fed with royal jelly for the first th 36 hours of their life. So if you look at a frame and see that milky pap on there, on the bottom, that's the right size larva to, uh, and this is how I do it. I take the hive tool right on in. I bend it down. Now I don't go right, I go right to the, the foundation, but if that larva is laying right there, then about an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch, I just bend it down. You don't touch the larva at all. Just bend it right down. So you can go to your hive, Remove the old queen in two frames of brood. Notch, notch all the other frames. 
and then put the hive back together and they'll raise queen cells there. Are you, are, is it okay if I ask a question? Yep. Okay, and we'll get into that. Okay. okay, so this is basically, I want you to get that concept of how I treat the larva, and then we'll go on how we manage the hives. Okay, I can do one at a time like I did on my business card. What I did there, when you read the book, it gets a little confusing because what I did is I killed all the other larvae on the frame by putting a bullet in there or a Q-tip. I sprinkled flour over the whole frame and that flower lands on that larva, and there's 10 spiracles on that larva. The other 10 are, are in the royal jelly, but there's only 10 they breathe out of that flower suffocated them. Then I flipped the frame over, knocked the Q-tips off, and the only larva that were good is the ones I protected with the bullets of the Q-tip. Then I went through there and I notched the bottom of those cells on every one of them, and that's how I got them to raise queen cells on that vertical frame like you have on my, my business card. So I can do one at a time, I can do two at a time, I can do three at a time. See how I just would notch that down a half inch, go to all the way to the midrib and break it down. And this is what you'll get. Got six nice uh, cells here. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And there might be six on the other side. I don't remember. But we'll get into that. But once you remove that old queen from the overwinter colony, what you have left is a hive with six or seven frames of brood. And that hive is in perfect condition now to raise queen cells. It's a, it's a cell builder because the queen is gone. Bees produce cells for three, three ways. One is swarm cells. Two are supersedure cells, and three are emergency cells. Okay, and this was basically an emergency because we removed the queen. Now Miller also, Dr. C.C. Miller also stated in 50 Years Among the Bees that if you give honeybees larvae of all ages, they will never, never accept a larva too old to raise a perfect queen. They just will not do it. And I have, in all my experiences, found that to be absolutely true. If you were to notch a larva that was too old, they would reject it. Okay, and that's what happened higher. I notched a little higher, and they rejected it. You can see where I probably put that hive tool right in there. And when you do the hive tool, you can get eight cells at a time. So, so you get some that are too old. If I see two or three in there, I just get all eight of them, and it's really fast. So go, you go into, a, go, go into the hive and do that, and uh, that, that shows you how I produce the queen cells. I'm not too good with this little hand deal. Okay. This just to give you a little idea of how I set up my hives. Now, it's a known fact that experienced beekeepers, you can take two frames of brood off an overwinter colony when it builds up, and you can take two frames of brood out of that without really hindering the production of that hive that year. Okay, so what I'm basically doing here, I got eight frames of brood in the spring. April 15th, I give them another box because they're gonna need it because they're getting in the, the swarming condition. May 5, uh, one week before swarming. One thing I will not allow is I'll not allow my bees to swarm. I kept them all year long, I overwintered them, and there's no way that I'm gonna lose half that colony. So I make an artificial swarm 
That's an artificial swarm. That's the overwintered queen. I let her build up to the 1st of July. Now, I say July 16 because I started by giving them a cell, but that doesn't work well, okay? You gotta have them do their own cell on July 5. Do, we'll do the same thing here. When I take this two frames of brood away, I still got six or seven frames in the regular hive. Now, I go through there. Now, I'm running this for honey now. If you run it for honey, you only notch one. One frame and let them raise their own queen. I come back a week later, and if they got six or seven cells in there, I break them all down but two. Because I don't want virgin queens running all over the hive trying to kill each other and use all their strength to kill other virgin queens. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let them kill one if two of them emerge. But what happens if you get too many virgin queens in the hive, uh, they'll fly out because they're trying to uh, get away from the other virgin and they'll land on, on a tree limb. Well, that's what they call a little after swarm. You gotta go about a cup of bees and a virgin queen and you deplete your, your colony that way. Okay, when, when a virgin queen is sexually mature in about four or five days, when she flies out of the hive, there's always a swarm that goes with her. Okay, on any queen that goes out of a hive, there's always a swarm that goes with her. On a real swarm, the old queen will land on a limb, they'll swarm, you know, and then they'll decide where they're gonna go, and that's the way it works. But a virgin that's sexually mature, when she flies out of that hive, that swarm will go with her, but she'll go right up over those treetops and she's on her mating flight. They'll go out there about 100 yards and all the bees will return back to the hive. She goes on her mating flight and returns back to the hive. Okay, so now if we do this for honey, okay, then what we're doing is do notching one. Now these are gonna be our future bees here, okay, because I'm gonna make four splits here in July off, off this queen because she's gonna have eight frames of brood by July, and I'm gonna make four splits here. The, I'm gonna overwinter, but these are these four splits that are overwinter. Okay, so uh, I just want, those are my future bees. I've already got myself set up for next year. Okay, now here, I got a real powerhouse. Strong colonies always do the best work, okay? So I got six frames of brood here now raising queen cells. A week later when I come back, the queen cells will be sealed and all the brood will be sealed, the open brood because it's three days in the egg, five days in the larva, that's eight days. So if I come back on the seventh day, maybe there's a half a day or so where there's one that isn't, isn't sealed yet. And then there are 13 days in the cap and they emerge on day 21. Okay, now it takes about 60 to 100 pounds of honey to produce brood for a month. Incredible amount of, of feed. This hive now has no, no brood, no brood to feed. So all the honey now comes in there and they, they'll, put, they'll put 120, 150 pounds of honey here. Okay? And it's a, a, a May start, so this queen will start laying here June 1. Now you go in there and you can take the honey off. That's a start. If you get 100, 120 pounds, just maybe leave one or two frames of honey for them to keep going and give them another super of empty foundation because there's a lot of bees there yet. You've already got twice the state average in honey. You've got your honey crop for the year. Okay, plus you got a start. Plus you got a new queen and a new start. This one here is already building up now and then on July 16 or, or July 5, I take that old queen, I go there, I take that old queen, and I kill her. Okay, now I got eight frames of brood in there. I notch all the, all the frames. And all I have to do now is get cells on four frames. Okay, because I'm gonna make four two brood frames starts. Okay, the old queen now lived one year. She was my July queen of, that I made uh, you know, the year before, overwintered. I pulled her off, made an artificial swarm, 
and she's my future bee. Okay? And those bees, this is all notched here. Okay, this is uh, Dr. Doolittle, or not Dr. <laughs> GM Doolittle, uh, explaining a little bit about him. Uh, this is the first five chapters of this book. It talks about bee behavior. Uh, it's a year's work in the out apiary by GM Doolittle. It's reprinted now by Wickes Press. First five chapters, it talks about producing comb honey, but the bee behavior involved with that. Uh, is very, very important, and that's what I based uh, my, uh, and I'll give, I'll put this on the web, and this will give a general uh, summary of those first five chapters. Now, GM Doolittle lived on the 43rd parallel. I live on the 43rd parallel in Grand Rapids, and Dr. C.C. C. Miller was just a little bit below the 43rd parallel uh, in Marengo, Illinois. So, when they wrote the book, a lot of it didn't make sense to me because he was getting eight frames of brood on May, May uh, 20, and I have it already on May 5. But what, what Doolittle did is he overwintered bees in the cellar. Back then they produced section comb honey all the way into the fall on the buckwheat, and so they went into the cellars in singles. Okay, so when bees are in a cellar, they don't produce brood. And when he took his bees out on April 14, they didn't have any brood, so he's actually two weeks or so behind me. And that's why when I read the book, it didn't make sense, and then I had to relook at it, and then I finally said, oh, okay, he didn't have brood, so he wasn't in his advance. So I wanted to not only enhance Miller's uh, method now of raising queens wherever I want to, but I'm also now enhancing Doolittle's book by instead of wintering indoors, I'm trying to winter what he called um, his, his, uh, his new st starts or uh, uh, he used them indoors. Uh, one thing I do want to get at is on the fifth visit on June 26, he, he's got cells and he starts new frames. Now, all of a sudden the light went on to me that, that June 26, is close enough to July 1, just four days or so. So he, what he did on June 26, I can do on July 1, is still within that envelope, see, and get, get the queens uh, that I need. Okay, Doolittle's approach, when he got section comb honey, he had the original hive, and then he, he uh, put sections on, and then he shook all the bees all the bees into the brood box. So now what he's got is he got a whole box of brood but no bees on them. So bees would come in here and he put, they put all the honey up into the section because honeybees always want to put the honey above the brood. Okay, so that's why, that's how he produced section honey. They call it uh, shook swarming for section honey. Now he's got this box of all six or seven frames of brood, okay, and he goes to a weaker colony and he puts an excluder on and he puts a bee, uh, beeless brood above that. Now that's one thing beekeepers don't understand is that bees can handle twice as much brood as they got. Okay, they can take care of it. The bees from below came up, had the heat. Bees are emerging all the time anyway out of that top box. So a week later, all these now are sealed and then a week later he would move them and you could leave them in the same apiary then because all the heavy work was done. All the, there's no open brood. 
so you can put them on the same a uh, new stand, give me, uh, do a little game of queen cell. Okay, but he had another colony to take care of the brood. Okay, now this is my approach. In the spring, I have eight frames of bees. Okay, and that makes a, a I remove the old queen two miles away, it's an artificial swarm. Okay. This is all according to nature. That's one week before swarming. Okay, so when, when, these, when these cells come out, it's still going to be inconsistent. There's going to be sexually mature drones out there to mate with. I've never had a problem with that. Okay, now this one builds up, okay, in the old queen. And these are my replacement bees that I'm going to make four starts in July. In the meantime, I got six broods of, frames of brood here on the original. I notch all six frames, okay? Because now, instead of producing honey, I'm gonna make starts. Okay, I'm gonna make three starts here, okay? So I notch them all, and all I have to do is have cells on three of them. Because I'm gonna make two frame, two brood frame, three, two brood frame starts. Okay, now the big hive did all the heavy work. They produced all the cells, and they sealed all the open brood. So the big hive, which always does the best work, did all the hard job, the heavy job. One week later now, I go in here, the ones with the cells on, I break down and make sure there's only two cells, and then I, I put two, two brood frames in each box, and I break all the cells down except two, okay? Now, instead of producing honey, now I'm making bees. If I were producing honey, I would only notch one frame and let all these bees produce all the honey. Okay, but now that I'm making starts, okay, I notch them all to make my splits. Now, this is a lot of information, but it's basic step by step. I say, Everything is a puzzle. It's just so many pieces to it. You know, a car has got so many pieces, and, and, and this is a, just a procedural thing. It looks like it's complicated, and it is a little bit, but it's still consistent to what nature is doing. And when you, when you understand the bee biology, it's easy to comprehend. So all I have to do now is remove the old queen, and when I do that, I put her in that splitter box that I designed Okay, and keep her right there, and then I just notch all the frames, put it back together, move the queen out. A week later, I come in there and make my start. So, this is a little bit different than the extended plan that you showed us. Because in the extended plan, you show the same idea on the top. I'm just trying to write my mind down. Yeah. With the two brood frame and the old queen. Yeah. Okay, okay, right? not quite. You got the right concept. See, I used the old queen, and I'm going to produce four here in July. Yeah. I'm using this one now to produce three more starts here. Okay, okay. so you use that to make honey. I can make that. I, if I only use one frame, then I make honey. Okay, if you're in honey production, that's what you do. You just notch one frame, put them all together, and let this hive produce honey. Okay, raise that queen for a month and produce honey, okay? But I should probably explain to you that I'm not a honey producer. I'm not a pollinator. I'm in less than 1% of the group. I always produce bees, okay? I, I make new bees, make new hives to sell, okay? So I understand that you want to produce honey, and this is where you can get more than your staged average right here. Okay, you follow what I'm getting at? The well, produce. It, it depends on if a person wants to exclusively make a lot more bees. Yep. If you want some more I'm giving you another option. This is how flexible this thing is. If you want to produce honey, you don't make the splits. If you want to make the splits, you can't do the honey. There's so much voltage in a beehive, and it's up to you how to de decide which way you want to manage your bees. I always manage my bees to get more bees. 
but there's honey here that, that manage their bees to get, get more starts. You see what I mean? So I'm telling you how to do both. Last time I was here, I was just telling you how to do starts, but people said, Mel, I want to produce honey. How can I do that? And I'm showing you, instead of making these three starts, we keep them all together, you see what I mean, and produce all the honey. Or, Mel, you can have it both, and you can create one start and double up and make more you, honey. You're flexible. You're the more you get into it, the more flexible you get. Now, I'm going to tell you uh, what I do here, okay? Now, these starts here, if I don't sell them, are going to have six frames of brood by the 1st of July. Okay, instead of eight frames of brood, like the old queen was laying right away, when this new queen starts laying now, the 1st of June, by the 1st of July, she's just going to pump, right, during the flows there, the spring flows, and she's going to have six frames of brood in here. Now, I can make three more starts out of each one of these. Okay, so now I make nine. Nine and the four up here, so now I made 13 starts out of that one hive at $100 a piece. Okay, so that's, you know, if you do the math, there's a lot of money in, in, in making bees. Okay, there's also a lot of money in producing honey if, if, you, don't, if you don't have to buy packages and, and you can start from overwinter stuff. Now, one thing about these starts, these July starts, is they don't know their starts. Only humans know their starts. In the spring, they're full string colonies. And the difference is, and I don't want to use too much time, the difference is, is that you got physiologically different bees. Because regular bees, the queen will lay and it gets to July and August and will slow down, okay, and are, or egg laid. Okay, that's the normal pattern. But when you do a July start and that virgin comes out after the, the summer solstice, solstice of June 21, day length is getting shorter. Okay, so then when she starts laying the 1st of August, day length is getting shorter and she won't quit. Okay, so she'll have three brood cycles before she quits, 63 days of laying egg ball, to expect them to raise all that brood and also produce enough stores to overwinter. Now, a lot of bees can do it, and then I came out with what I call a sugar brick. I feed them a sugar brick, which is a candy board, basically, and I put it on top of a, of a queen excluder, um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, too. Okay, we see what Doolittle did. And this is what I, I do now. Eight frames of brood. I make that split. That's kind of rep, uh, repetitious. Okay. Um, you, I move that two miles. Step two. I got six frames of brood left. Okay. Uh, and I, I do my, my notching. And so really I made four. The three and then the one, the old queen that was moved two miles away. That's my website. Now, when you produce that honey, the question you had there, this is what you'll get. See, we only notch one frame here, okay? And then um, I offset this to give them an upper entrance. A week later, we went in there, and I think there was four cells in there, and I broke two of them down, okay, because I don't want four cells in there. The queen, this whole month, this is the month now of June, uh, of May. Black locust is blooming and there's a good, good honey flows on, dandelion and et cetera. This hive produced about 150, 175 pounds of honey, okay? June, uh, the first week in June we went there and we pulled the first top two boxes off, okay? Because I thought the queen was down here. Well, this was solid honey. Okay, and I said, we got a mismating. Well, even if you do get a mismating, and you will on occasion, you still got the honey. Okay, you didn't lose everything, but you got your, because you got the old queen on your four replacement bees that we, we pulled out on top. Okay, so you still got the honey. Well, we went through there, all of a sudden we found the queen had 
gone all the way up to the top, and she has three frames of brood up here, the new, the new queen did. So we just took this box, put it on the bottom, and then uh, took the honey away and extracted it. Then you, you got to give them another box of foundation because you still got an awful lot of bees there, and that's a good way to draw a comb yet. Now this is also a July start. Okay, just like we would normally have, I can split this one again in June, three ways. Okay, but the sad part of the, about that is I got to kill this queen again because she was mated before June 21. Okay, I got to kill her on 1st of July and then notch the combs again to get those new queens that were raised after June 21 and start laying in August because the days are getting shorter. Okay, this queen here, if I left her alone, she would slow down like any, any other normal queen in July and August because she was mated before June 21. Okay, this is what a three frame start will look like, or two frame start will look like a month later. The queen's laying, but you see all the honey? They had no brood to feed, so they got honey. They'll have about three frames of honey because they had no brood to feed while they were raising that queen cell. Okay, so all that honey came in, and that's the same principle of producing your big honey crop on the full. Now, in, in seven days or ten days, they'll turn all that honey into bees because she'll just be laying right, right from the get-go, okay? And she'll, she'll turn all that honey right into bees, so then I start feeding. Any start, I mean, this really gives them a good go, good go, but any start should have feed. And when I went to the solid feed here, it eliminated the dripping and the sugar water, and sometimes sugar, if they don't take it all, a week later it'll ferment if you have real hot weather and you're throwing a lot of sugar away. And so I went to this sugar brick and they take it as they need it. You get three, four rainy days, you know, they can still, still handle that just fine. Okay, uh, this just shows that I sell nukes too, you know, and then I can just package them up in that splitter box that I designed in 1979. This is what this brick looks like above an excluder, okay? I have an excluder there, I prop it up a quarter inch so I don't sit on the top bars, okay? And then uh, the bees are feeding on that, okay? Do you sell any websites how you make your sugar bricks? I did at one time, I had the recipe on there. But then uh, people were having problems making it, so I just start making it for them. And then I took the recipe off, and there's sugar bricks there, but I think if you go to Google search, and then um, just type in candy board or candy board recipes, I think you'll be able to, uh, to get that out. Yeah. What are your thoughts on bees? Well, bees need need uh, bees definitely need, um, especially if you buy package or, or starts, they need sugar to um, they need sugar to uh, to draw comb out. Okay, it takes seven pounds of honey to produce a pound of beeswax. So if you buy a package or start with a nuke you want to feed them because they got to draw a comb out. That's a tremendous a lot of work for, for the bees to do. Just because there's flowers in the field doesn't mean that that's adequate. You see what I mean? You got to feed them. You got, they got to draw a comb. I say to a lot of people, the first year you just draw the comb out. You see what I mean? And then, uh, and then you get your replacement bees. Yes, if I have drawn comb, I'll put it in, okay. Um, but if I if they have foundation, you just gotta just treat it like you would a package. You know, you just gotta build it up. Okay, so you don't put any pollen or any honey strain. No, because it, they can get that. You see what I mean? They can. Uh, if you got honey, that's the best feed in the world. That's better than the sugar bricks. If you got honey to put right there, that's the best feed there is. 
just the way it mean. But usually with this situation, I don't have any extra honey unless I want to unite those nukes instead of having all those nukes. During, during July, where the main honey flow is in Michigan, I'll just combine them all, you see what I mean? And then let them produce a, a lot of honey. Then, then instead of having the extra starts, I got that honey to give my other starts the next spring. You see, that's the way I, I normally do that. I just want to show you a couple, a couple graphs here. Okay, this, now this is, this also breaks the varroa mite cycle. Now, varroa females always go in the cell on the day before it's sealed, on day eight, okay? Just before it's sealed and then it's 13 days under the cap. So really the life cycle of varroa mite is only 13 days, okay, compared to 21 days for the honeybee. Okay, so they can not only, you get a mix, mixed feeling if you do the math and figure it out. So if you have a hundred mites, that's where I notch those combs now, okay, I have emerging brood and right in through here and then the new queen will slow down here in November. The other ones would slow down already in August and September, okay. So I got three brood cycles, 63 days of brood rearing here, enough young bees to go over winter. Got a very young queen, very young bees, five or seven frames or, or five seams that's in a single deep. I put on a candy board, and actually I'm, I'm not putting on pollen patties now until the first of March or so, because if they start working that pollen patty like, like they did this year, uh, they get uh, fiber in their, in their belly, and that's when the SEMA can, can pick up, okay? Because like this year, they didn't have a cleansing flight. If you have a cleansing flight, you're all right. But if they got to build that up and build that up, and I feel they don't need that pollen until the first of March here. They can build up fast enough. Uh, just just on uh, wait until March. Okay. Okay. And here shows where the old queen would go, June 21, the solstice, and she starts slowing down. Okay, now, my July queen starts mating at about the 1st of August here, see? And she don't slow down until the end of November. And that's why you got all those young bees going on into winter. And that's the difference, okay? Now, I've been overwintering, when I do my July starts, I've been overwintering three out of the four, okay? Because... It, now, I only have to overwinter one because I started with one hive in the spring. I took the old queen out. Those are my future bees. I made four in July. So if I only overwinter one, I got the same numbers I started with. Plus, I got that honey crop. Okay, so I can lose three of those July starts and still not lose any bees because I still got the one that I started with. Is that clear? I, a nuke will. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even if you buy a nuke now, it's only going to have eight frames of brood by July, basically July 1. Okay, a nuke is basically a package just hived 30 days earlier. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, so the old, I overwintered. I took the old queen out. I made four more hives with her in July. Now, I only have to overwinter one of those because I started with one. So I got 100% success of overwintering. But I've been overwintering three out of the four. So over winter, I've been making more increase. Okay? And this is where I think beekeeping is going to go in the future. Okay? Where, but the fiscal year is going to change a little bit because my fiscal year starts from July to July. See, I'm not in the spring looking for bees. I got bees. I do my, I start my next year in July. Okay? A little different concept in beekeeping. And like I told you, I, I think different. <laughs> Most people are honey producers or pollinators, and I produce bees, see? And that's what I always have 
for, for the 40 years. Okay, now this is how, how much time we got? Huh? I got about 50 minutes or 10? Okay. <laughs> okay, here's how that works. Okay, I told you about that roll mite, and this is on the web too. And you, all this stuff is on the web, so I know I'm going fast, and, but it's there out there for you to, to comprehend. Everything is free and, and downloadable, okay? Now, here's the, uh, the old carryover queen, okay? Now, here's, here's the gestational period, and like I told you, the 13 days for the mite. She goes into the cell on day eight, okay? Okay, now the honeybee larva takes 21 days from the laying of the egg to the emergent. So what you got to have now is you got to have all the brood emerge. All the brood has to emerge. So the, the female, the, the, the varroa mite is fertilized inside the cell under the capping and when she comes out she's fertilized. Okay, so now there's no more brood in the hive. So all the fertile mites are on the bees. Okay, now, when the new queen starts laying, okay, the new queen mates, the new queen starts laying, the first larva from the new queen, all the bees now have been emerged. Okay, all the, all the fertile mites are on the bees. Now, I've taken away the stimulus because there's no, and the medium. There's no place to lay eggs because there's no eight, eight day old larva or five day old larva in the hive until that new queen starts laying again, see? She'll lay three days in the egg. On day eight, all these female mites now that are on the bees, all of a sudden now got medium to lay the eggs on and they got the stimulus because of the pheromone of that five day old larva. So you get an overload I've counted one cell with 14 mites in it. What happens is they go in that cell, the bees seal it over. They start feeding on the blood, the hemolymph of that little larva, the honeybee larva, and they suck all that hemolymph out. So that little larva dies, but so do the mites because they can't complete their breeding cycle. Okay, now that's not an eradication it's just a huge road bump. Okay, the only mites that survive are the ones in the periphery that one or two mites went into those cells. So I'm going into the winter with young bees and almost mite free. And that's a biological assault. That's uh, the weak link in the, the varroa mites breeding cycle. If they could breed at all times, we couldn't do that. But when I studied the mites breeding cycle, that was the weak link. They always went in on day eight. So how do I now design my hive to do a biological assault on them that they can never build up in the resistance to? Okay. And I've been overwintering my bees and doing this for 20 years. You're going to have to feed them. You know, you have to take care of them because the July start is a little bit a little bit uh, more tender, but it still is stronger in, in many ways. I give them good wind breaks. I, uh, what I'm, what I'm going to be doing now in the next few years is in August, I'm going to be moving them to isolated areas, okay, because I've been having some problems in the last few years with agricultural related. I don't know for sure if that's the problem, but I'm having more problems in agricultural areas and all my friends that are more isolated, their bees are coming out just fine. So there's something in my opinion that has to do with agricultural that is, is, is hitting these bees. In fact, I lost two yards here between October and November. And in my opinion, I think it has to do with the harvesting of corn uh, with the uh, new neonic pesticides. Uh, I'm not saying that's what it is, but it's the, the subject of interest to me right now because I think it gets in the dust 
and that's when I would have my colony collapse. It seems like that's when all my bees are, are having most trouble. Okay, now um, I believe in my mind it's going to have to be proven, and, and I'm having lots of people working on this. But I think, I think this, these pesticides are almost like an HIV. Nobody ever dies of HIV, they die of pneumonia. The HIV weakened them, so now pneumonia can kill them. And I think that's what we're seeing. I think those neonics are, are weakening the bee, the pesticides, because the farmers can't keep it in the, on the fields no more. If you go to a Google search, and type in neonicotoid, you're going to get all kinds of hits. It's in the water system now. It's, it's all kinds of stuff. Farmers can't keep it on the fields. It's getting into the water system and others. And I don't know if they got instruments enough, sense enough to, to pick, a, pick it up. It might be one part per trillion or one part per 10 billion, you know, that can affect the honeybees. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, you mentioned Yep. Okay, so he was taking single brood box plus feed, or was he feeding them? Uh, he would give them honey. Okay, in he, had a, yeah. he had a single deep super, deep brood box and some and feed, and he was putting them into a cellar, so he was keeping them dark and cool. Dark and cool, and there's no brood rearing. Okay. So all that they were doing is existing. All right, so, and so the reason he was behind was because there was no brood rearing, is that Right. It? And yours with yours. Yeah, when he he, he took his bees out on April 14th. Yeah, they had no brood. And yours had already started. Yeah, well, my, mine were already started two okay, weeks ahead. Can you talk a little bit more about physically how you overwinter these small colonies? Are they in a single deep? Yes. Box? Okay. Do you cluster them up together, okay. or how do you do that? No, no, they're all they're all singles. Okay, and what I do is. Uh, I like to get the bees up, so I put an extra box underneath them. Okay, they're going to need that in the spring anyway, because they're going to come out full strength colonies. Okay, so they need, so I want them up off off the bottom board a little bit, and then I put that that candy board or my bricks above that. But I don't do that until maybe January one. I quit feeding them on November one. Okay. And so November 1 and all November and all December, they're just normal hives. There's no brood in there anyway, you see. So they just exist like any normal colony, okay? Then in January, I like to, because the way I feed now, I can lift off the cover, you see what I mean? And I can put these right on. It's not like a candy board where you have to open up the hive. And, and get into the frames. So I've already got the empty super on or the, the shell for the, for the candy bricks, and then I just lay them on there, okay, and close them up and make sure you give them good ventilation, even kind of vent the top, because bees do need ventilation, and you need, what kills bees is moisture, okay, so you have to, have to get the, the moisture out, okay, and you get good ventilation through there, okay. Cold does not kill honeybees. Moisture does, okay, and they got to have feed. Uh, they were mentioned earlier. If they run out of feed, then they'll starve too. And this last winter, from January one till the middle of February, uh, we didn't have a break. Nothing got above forty degrees. So uh, if they couldn't reach honey, they starved. Okay. You said, uh, but it, you put the, your candy brick above the queen, queen excluder. Yep. Yeah, because I, uh, I prop my queen excluder up a quarter inch and I put my candy bricks on there because I don't want that weight of the candy brick forcing that down on the top bars. I want to be able to have space to crawl in underneath that. So the queen, evidently the queen never goes up that high then? No, she has no reason to. Well, she can't either. No, Unless no, she doesn't. Uh, when the bees go out and feed, then they come down Yeah, they're, they'll be just like that picture I showed you. They're, they're right, yeah. Um, not strictly because they do have some honey. It depends on the type of year. You see what I mean? But that's well, a si they have with the candy yeah. Whatever that they could make up. If I got a frame of honey or so, I'll put it in there. Okay. You see what I mean in the fall? Because I said honey is the best feed. But if they don't have that, then I go with the. Uh, and how many bricks would you go to? Uh, I, the way I got this designed 
It's a six by six by four. The inside of a super is 18 and a half inches, so I can use that three, put three of them. Right there, I can put six in the, in the super. I can put six in, the, in an empty super or that shell, okay? Because then no matter where they come up, you see what I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll hit that sugar brick, see, instead of being, being confined. Um, but there are usually only three, uh, about five frames seams of bees, and so I can see that when I put the bricks on where about that seam is because they're in a single. I can look down and see right where they are, and so I can put them right on top of them. They come up and run, run into it. Doesn't that empty super just create more of an area that they have to keep warm? Uh, bees don't keep the inside of a hive warm. They only keep the cluster warm. That's, uh, it's nice to be able to hold heat in a little bit, but ventilation is more important than, than insulation. Because when you go to a bee tree, okay, where bees will overwinter naturally outdoors, uh, they, they have an open bottom, but that heat can escape too. You see, I mean, they're just well protected because of the bark of the tree. And I do wrap them to give them an extra wind protection, but I'm real careful. I, I try to get good wind breaks. You know, wind breaks and, and a tar paper wrap, but good ventilation, that's important. Now people ask me about screen bottom boards. That's just something that just happened the last 20 years. They've overwintered healthy bees for, in solid bottom boards for 100 years. You see what I mean? And I've always stayed with solid bottom boards. Okay, but I, you know, um, the problem I would have with a screen bottom board, and I don't really get into that too much, but sometimes a queen will, because I made a lot of queens, and if they come in under the hive, they can smell the, 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 the brood and stuff. They crawl in and want to get in that screen from underneath, and they can't. So I lose, I lose that hive, you see what I mean? Whereas if you just had that one entrance there that she can zero to. Another thing is that in Michigan winters here, you at least have two days with 50 mile an hour winds and a blizzard. You know, one thing that'll kill bees is moisture, like I told you. And if you have a window of uh, your open and the snow is coming from the right direction, you can have snow, you know, come right in on your dresser or so. And, um, in five minutes or so, if that happens, those bees are dead. If that snow blows up into that cluster, they can't handle that. See. What way are you facing the hive? I I don't uh, I don't I, I usually face them east and west. I'll put four four together. Otherwise, if you put them in a long row, you know, you just face them south. I think that's the better way. But I, east and west is fine. Uh, I never have. I, I, I like south because southern exposure, you know, the, the sun can come down and... Okay. Well, then you just have to, uh, you know, have three, deep, uh, three mediums to two, two deeps. You'd have the same amount of comb area. Pardon me? You might have to do three because you might have brood in, uh, in 12 frames then, see? Uh, then you'd use three frames with brood. There's no possible way of building up a spring package to do any of this kind of thing. Does that have to be overwintered strong hive? Um, actually, your spring package couldn't be uh, eight frames or uh, uh, bees by July 1. You could do a four-frame uh, split. You see what I mean? And um, I... I would think that you'd have maybe a better chance to overwinter because what I've been hearing in the last few years is hard to overwinter packages. Yeah, the smaller colonies. Well, that, that's what I've been, the people that, that I've been.